God is good. All the time. All the time. Children, you're dismissed to Children's Church. You can go. Miss Kayla, if you have your Bibles this morning, if you would, hold them up. Let me see them. Shake them around. Shake them. Shake them. All right. Devil hates that kind of stuff. We're still in the John, John chapter 15. We talked about fruit last week and that God has challenged us all that we must be bearers of fruit. We're going to produce fruit. Good, bad, or indifferent, we're going to produce fruit. But God wants us to produce His fruit. Say His fruit. His fruit. His fruit. fruit. Say it again. His fruit. His fruit. Thank you. So we're going to pick up now in chapter 15, and we're going to start in verse 9. It reads this way. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love, and if you obey my commands... You will remain in my love. Now, how do we remain in his love? Now, we talked a little bit last week about remaining in the vine, and and that was kind of a metaphor that we used. Now we're getting to the practical application of how do we remain in God? And we remain in God by obeying his commands. Now, hold on. We're going to figure out what that command is and what some of his commands are. So, hold on. Here we go. Just as I've obeyed my Father's commands and remained in His love, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. You ready? My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love is no one than he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. If you do what I command... I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made it known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. Do what? Bear fruit. Fruit that will last. Then the father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command. What? Love each other. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word, and we ask this morning to open our hearts and minds that we may receive your truth. Thank you for loving us, Lord, and help us to unpack that a little bit today that we may be clearer and depend more and love more. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. Love. Love is usually reserved here for a topic that I get Dan to cover because, you know, he's the love expert and he, he likes to talk about love and for right reasons, for good reasons, because love is the crux of which all our faith and all our faith is really founded on. If you look in um, and the Greek, and you, tr- you just try to unpack some of this, and you understand what love is. And love is a, a big word for us. It's a broad-based brush for us in the Western culture. In the Greek culture, it's not so broad-based. It's basically they had words for different types of love. That There are six that, uh, that are recognized mainly, but some people recognize even eight nuances of different types of love in the Greek. And Some of those loves are, first of all, the Christian love. We call the Christian love, but it's agape love. It's unconditional love. The eros love is defined for lovers. The philia uh, word for love is more friendship. And the storge love is basically developed around sibling and parents and that kind of love. And then the xena love is more for hospitality. In other words, greeting people and hosting people. And these six words break down this big word of love into different categories so we can kind of chew that and understand the appropriateness of each setting and how love can be applied. For example, when I'm with my wife and we get ready for Eros, I don't want no philia to come involved. I'm ready for Eros. Amen? Can I get a witness? (laughs) Oh, y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, we need to have a marriage class is what we need to have. 
Anyway, and, and the same thing, you know, uh, we don't want to swap different types of love for different types of things. So in the Greek, they kind of identified it. But agape love is the unconditional love that God is talking about here in this text. There was a song that came out in 1984. It was sung by Tina Turner. I was in Germany at the time. And man, I tell you what, it's something about being in a foreign country, being trapped there for about four or five years that makes you appreciate everything America and anything American. Lee Greenwood had a song out, um, you know, I'm glad to be American. Y'all remember that? We used to get up on top of tabletops and sing that song because, you know, we were so patriotic because we were in a foreign country and we had nothing and all the memories and everything like that. But there was also a song that came out by Tina Turner which was a great artist and great singer. And the title of it is, What's Love Got to Do With It? Anybody remember that song? What's love got to do, got to do with it? There was a great song, I mean, a great line in there that is true about how most of us feel about love. It says, what's love got to do with it? It's just a second-hand emotion. Who needs a heart? When a heart can be broken. Y'all remember that? And everybody identified with that song because everybody probably in this room has experienced at some point a broken heart. Have we not? And you say, well, that's more of a, you know, it's it's an Eros type song and everything. Well, let me tell you something. I remember when my bird dog got killed when I was 12 years old. Okay. That broke my heart. Okay, because I love that dog. And I tell you, I swore at that point that I would never love a dog like that ever in my life. You know why? Because it broke my heart. And here's the thing. A lot of us will close a part of our heart off, a part of our life off, because of a negative experience that we've had or brokenness that we've had and when we do it brings it builds a callus on it and we do not and we rob ourselves and we do not get to enjoy what that quality brings to us again in our life because we're closed off from it most people that gone through has gone through bad relationships they don't want to get in another relationship because why what's love got to do with it? it's just a secondhand emotion who needs a heart when my heart can be broken, right? That's the testament of this song. And that was a testament of most people because everybody could identify with a broken heart, whether it came through a relationship or whether it came through a dog. Last night, about a month ago, maybe a little over, I don't know, I got a dog. It's the first time since I was about 12, 14 years old, I got a dog. I got a dog. And you know what? I love that dog. That dog worships me. Every time I let that dog out of its pen, he wants to jump up on me and say, I love you, I love you, I love you, I love you. Oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. And I'm sitting there trying to get down, get down off of me. You a good boy, yeah. You a good boy, yeah. And it goes back and forth. All the time, because I'm trying to regulate his enthusiasm about showing how much he loves me. But I'm here to declare, that dog loves me. And I love that dog. First time since I was 12 or 14 years old that I've ever had a dog that I love. She had a dog. She loves it. I don't love that dog. But I sure do love my dog. I let him out of the pen, and, and we walk around the pond. He stays right there with me, and he's sniffing stuff out and making sure that everything's okay and safe. And every once in a while, he sees a frog. He can't help it. He jumps in the pond, and he swims around, gets all wet, and comes out and shakes all over me. I'm going, well, doggone it, dog. That's okay. Come on. We'll walk to the dock, and we'll feed the fish, and the fish will come up, and he stands on the dock looking at him like me. We're both sitting there, and I just got tickled, both of us sitting there looking at those fish feeding the other day. I'm going, I must be getting old. I'm enjoying this. (laughs) And then last night, I let him out because I didn't want him to be in the pen, and I was watching the Kentucky Derby because I wanted to watch the Kentucky Derby because I like to see those horses run. And they were all in the pomp and circumstance, and I wanted to let my dog out. didn't want to keep him in the pen so much. 
So I let him out, and he went back to the back deck, and he's sitting there at the porch, just looking at the window, waiting for me to come out, just sitting there waiting, sitting there waiting. Then after about, I got caught up in all the ritual stuff and all the pomp and circumstance of this uh, Kentucky Derby, Derby, and the race was won, and man, it was a great race. Won it by nose. I love three horses together, and it's just a nose difference, you know. It was just a great race. I got up, and I went out. Scooter! 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 You know what? My dog had gone. My heart flipped in my chest, went down in my stomach, and says, I ain't doing this no more. Because I had a memory of when I was 12 years old. And I didn't want to lose that dog. I went around, and I went all the way around the yard looking for that dog. I got on the gator, and I go back in the back 40. Only got 15 acres, but I went back there. Look through the woods, call him, Scooter! 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 Nothing. Came back in the house. I said, he's gone. She says, oh, my Lord, what happened? I said, I don't know, he's gone. And I said, Put, got my keys and stuff. I got to go, go look for him. I got in the truck, and I started out, trek, going up and down roads, searching for that dog. Finally, I found that dog, and my heart leaped with joy. And I got out of the truck, I'm going, what are you doing, dog? <laughs> Do you know I've been worrying myself sick over you? Now get in this truck and let's go to the house. And he's sitting there. He knows he's done done something wrong, and he knows he's in big trouble. He gets in the back of the truck, and he's just sitting there, and he's just sitting there going, oh, okay. I go back to the house. Let him out, and I said, now you get in the pen, and you're going to stay in the pen till I let you out. Don't you ever do this again. You want some food here? <laughs> some water? Okay, you got your blanket right over there. Okay, you good? All right, you good boy. Don't you ever do that again. Closed the pen up, went out. <sighs> I felt so good. And I got to thinking, I nearly didn't get this dog. And after I got this dog, and I really loved this dog, when he didn't show up for me, I was regretting I ever got the dog until I saw the dog again. And when I saw the dog again, my heart lit back up again, and we started relationship again. And it got me thinking about this thing called love. You see, here's the thing. What's love got to do with it? It's a second-hand emotion. Most of us equate love with an emotion instead of understanding what true love really is. True love is a commitment. And sometimes the emotion that comes with that commitment is ecstasy. And sometimes that emotion connected with it is fear and brokenness and heartache. But if we allow the motion to allow us to choose to love or not to love, we will never unpack and be revealed to or never receive the truest treasure that has, God has for our hearts. Jesus knew that. He made this comment. He said, the Father has loved me. And man, I've experienced that love, and it's so great, you cannot comprehend it. And as my fathers love me, I love you. But I'm going to tell you, you broke my heart from time to time. You've disappointed me from time to time. Things are in your life that needs to be straightened out because they're not following me. You say you love me. But I see no fruit of that love. But even in that case, I want you to know I still love you. Because his is not an emotion. His is a choice. He chooses. He said, what? You have not chose me. But what? What did he say? I have chose you. It's a commitment. That he's made to us. 
And even though we fail in that commitment, even though we run off to the next neighborhood, even though he gets upset and afraid for us and fearful because he knows there's danger out there, he knows we could get squashed, he knows that we could have destruction and chaos and and, uh, all kinds of mayhem that may come in our life, he cons- concerned and, and he wants the good things for us. He wants the good fruit for us. He wants all these things. He still, even though all that heartache, all that stress, all that stuff that comes with it, he still chooses to love us because he doesn't see love as a second hand emotion. He doesn't see love as something that is useless because who needs a heart when a heart can be broken? He looks at the possibility because we have a heart. There's a flourishing possibility of greatness and fulfillment and love and joy that can habitate that heart. And he knows the possibility with a heart. And when you don't have a heart, there is none. And God says, I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to take the risk. I'm going to choose to love you. Listen, a lot of people want to take and define love as this willy-nilly, fuzzy-wuzzy, oozy-goozy type of motion and feeling that you're supposed to just love me. All the time. There's no greater love that a parent can have for their chis for their children. Would would the parents agree with me with that? Yes. And listen, my love has never waned for my children. I love my children to the umph degree. I love them so much that I will do hard things for them and make them do hard things because I know it's for their better benefit and for their good. And it, kills me sometimes I don't want to do it but I know I must do it if I love them the way God wants me to love them Hmm. some people want to say love is unaccountable scripture never said that love was unaccountable it says love is unconditional But it never said love is unaccountable. Accountability with love is what makes love really tick and work. Do you know that God is going to hold us accountable for our love and for his love to us? We all. Have you ever read Revelation? Anybody? There's going to be an accountability. There's going to be a judgment day. He loved us so much he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have life everlasting and free, not only in the lifetime to come but in this lifetime as well. We struggle to receive that freedom and that joy and that fullness in life because we have so much emotion that's attached to our love. Improperly sometimes, misused sometimes, misdefined sometimes but we don't understand that God's love is unconditional because of a choice but it's very accountable because of a holiness and a righteousness that God lives in and desires us to live in as well so when you say that somebody is being hard on me or they're judging me, maybe they're just holding you accountable because they do love you. I can't tell you how many people that have left churches, sometimes they're correct because church, just like everything else in relationship, can get toxic and out of order. But sometimes a lot of people will leave a church just because a church is holding them accountable to a standard of conduct in which they should live by. Not in judgment, but in challenge. It's called accountability. And by the way, if you didn't know it, Scripture is full of what we call church discipline that really doesn't happen in the 21st century church. And it's really sad to a great degree. Church discipline is just challenging each other to live to the standard of which God has set for us and how we should live. Jesus, I think, unpacks this really perfectly 
in this text when he says, he says this, if you love me, there will be proof that you will love me. And this is how the proof lies. This is how it works out. You will choose to obey my commands. This is not conditional. This is just for us remaining in the vine. Remember the scripture that we talked about last Sunday in verses 1 through 9? You remember that we are to remain in the vine. He is the vine and we are the branches. And if we're going to produce fruit, we have to remain in him. This is him unpacking that and said, this is how you remain in me. You remain in me by loving one another. This is my command. And you can't remain in me if you're not keeping that command. You've got to keep that command. You have to choose to love one another. And I can't tell you how many times that I have talked to people that says, yeah, I love most people. There's one guy over there I can't stand. I hate his goods. Okay, I'm sorry. That's out of bounds. You can't hate his guts. You can, you can not like him all you want to, but you can't hate him. Amen? You got to love him. What is love? That's just a secondhand emotion. What do you mean I got to love him? It's emotional. I don't want emotional love. No, you have to choose to love him. A commitment, no matter what he does, you're still going to love him. It doesn't mean you have to agree with him. It doesn't mean you have to accept him. What it means is that you have to choose that you're going to love him no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. And I don't. I really don't. How about you? For some people, I really, really don't. It's a few. But they, they still exist. But then I get back and I understand what Jesus said. I have to remain in him. If I remain in him, I can't remain in him everything but my big toe. I got to get it in. And that means I got to choose to love him. No matter what. Now, it doesn't mean I don't set boundaries. It doesn't mean that I try to manage the situation that it won't get toxic or anything, but it means I love him or her. And there's some hers too. Believe me. But we choose to love them. So the question is what's love got to do with it? Here's what God says. Listen, you need, you need to write this down because this is important. Here's what God says about what's love got to do with it. He says, everything. Everything. Listen, I want to read a scripture in 1 John. You know, John's got a lot of, a lot of writings in the Bible. It's John, then there's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and then Revelation. But in 2nd John, I mean, excuse me, in 1st John chapter 4, he writes this, and he pins this, I think it's probably one of the most definitive explanations of what God requires for us in love that I've ever read. And it goes like this. It says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Ooh. Do you hear that? Love comes from God. Okay. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God. Because God is love. Say God is love. This is how God showed his love among, among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we may have life through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an anointing sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God loves, so loves us, we also ought to love one another. For no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another... God lives in us, and his love is made complete. Listen, it's made complete. You've got to hear this. It's made complete in us. What's, got to, what's love got to do with it? Everything. Say it with me. Everything. This morning... We're going to observe Holy Communion. I can't think of a more fitting thing to do to finish this sermon. Because he had this 
section in this text that read, no greater love a man that he lay down his life for a friend. Most people interpret that as that we lay down our life. We die. Okay. Ah, I don't. Mm. That's what Jesus had to do. But I don't necessarily, it's true. Die, dying is probably pretty easy because, you know, you just make a choice. You close your eyes, bang, it's over with. Boom. <laughs> I'm just being real, okay? But here's what the definition of laying down a life says in, in the Strongest is this. Laying down a life means that we arrange our life in such a way that the people we love are honored, edified, and lifted up. Did you all hear that? It's arranging our lives and to where others mean more than us. That's what laying down our lives. No greater love than a man that he laid down his life. He arranges his life for his friend. Jesus had to die, but really Jesus had the power over death anyway. But what he did was he arranged his life in such a way that we would have hope. We would have redemption. We would have life everlasting and free. We would have a relationship back with the Father. He arranged his life to do whatever it took so that communion with God would be possible. It required him to die. And then he conquered death. And the third day he rose from the dead and stamped his stamp of authority for all eternity that he was, he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And he asked us, every time we come together, as often as you come together, and you do this ritual, this sacrament, this exercise of memory, that you remember what he did for us, that we may take that example and do it every day of our lives for others. Because what did he say? If you don't love your neighbor, you don't love God, and that we're to love one another if we love him. And that's the example, I think, that Jesus set for us when he went to the cross. We're to arrange our lives into which that others knows that we love them more than we love ourselves. And that's what Jesus did. This morning we're going to receive Holy Communion. And one of our core values is this. Everyone is welcome to the table. Anyone and everyone. Kids, guests, visitors, you're all welcome to receive Holy Communion. As you come, we ask you to come with your hands cupped, ready to receive. I will place a piece of bread in your hand. Dan will be here with a cup and you'll receive a juice. You can stay here and pray or you can go back to your, uh, your, your seats and pray. But we want to commune with God as we remember his love for us that we in return may love, her, love others as he loved us. Amen. On the night he gathered with his disciples, he took bread, he blessed it, broke it. Father, we thank you for the bread that we have this morning. We pray, Lord, that you will bless it, that we may remember you as we receive it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Likewise, he took the cup. And he blessed it. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this cup. May it be for us a symbol of remembering that our sins are forgiven and that we also have a new covenant now with the Father through you. Thank you, Lord, for your blood that was shed. Father, pour out your spirit upon these elements for us today that they may be the body and the blood of Christ, that we may remember your love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.